Welcome back, Leaders Live. Charlie Stevens, your host here with Nathan Hecht, CEO, founder of Roto. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We're practicing our social distancing here. Uh, no one's in the office, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can talk far further away than normal. Uh, reason why we're doing the show, understand how business leaders like Nathan operate. And once we understand how they operate, we can hopefully connect them with you, the people of LinkedIn, uh, find some partnerships together. We could all work together, make, make some intros to VCs or other founders, CEOs that can help your business, help other people's businesses, and we all can work together. Uh, just a quick heads up, if you can tag someone possibly, first of all, check in. We're on LinkedIn Live, so check in, make a comment. Uh, check in, say you're watching, say hello. So hello back to you. And uh, if you got any questions throughout this, please put them in the comments and then we'll have the Roto team answer them uh, throughout the week. And uh, hopefully we can answer all your questions, but also if you hear anything that's a good tip, a key gem, uh, make a comment so we can maybe make some micro content and share it with uh, the community. So enough of me, enough of my talking. Let's get to you, uh, the man of the hour. Uh, entrepreneur, you started three companies. Kind of, Can you give us some context before Roto? what you were doing, uh, you had some companies basically built out of crises, kind of like the one we're in now, but give us some context what you're doing, and I guess starting back in 2000, right? You, you started yeah. a company, but the floor is yours. Sure, thank you, um, and thanks for having me. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm actually pretty familiar with uh, uh, crises, um, for better or worse. My first company I started in 2000, just a few months before 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, and we know the world changed then, but actually the world changed about a year before 9-11 when um, the dot-com boom collapsed, right. essentially. Um, so I had a, a company that we had started in semiconductors and what's known as embedded software. Um, it was a business that started, that became an opportunity because um, a lot of the infrastructure that was being built for the internet in the mid and, and late 90s, when the dot-com boom collapsed, um, there was a lot of this hardware available um, that wasn't being used, that was being written off by companies. So we first started with moving some of these components um, from one manufacturer to another that actually needed it. Mm -hmm. And that business evolved, uh, and it was very opportunistic. Uh, we bought low and sold high. And that business evolved into an embedded software business um, for military and aerospace applications, which basically means you take um, commercial components and you manipulate them in certain ways to work in extreme environments. And we built that business up, a uh, pretty significant company. Uh, we operated in five different countries until the financial crisis, which was the second um, crisis that I became familiar with. And we had actually, uh, I, I sold my portion of that company r just, just literally a couple of months before the crisis peaked. Um, we actually were, um, were not looking to sell. We were looking to raise more capital, but mm -hmm. as the markets melted down, uh, it became very difficult to do that, and circumstances changed, and we sort of adopted to the circumstances. Um, and then, um, as the world evolved post-financial crisis, um, social media became very popular, cybersecurity became a big category, yep. I dabbled, and, and Bitcoin, virtual currency, became a big category as well. So I dabbled in virtual currency for a while. I am not Satoshi. Uh, the founder of Bitcoin, but so was you say. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer, <laughs> but um, uh, but it was a time where where sort of people were th starting to think about money and finance um, differently, and Bitcoin was born. And then after that, I I got I started a cybersecurity software business, mm -hmm. which was my second company. And then about three and a half years ago, we started Roto, uh, which was formerly known as Honker. That was our original name and we rebranded about uh, seven or eight months ago to Roto. And just a, a tiny tidbit if I can plug what yeah, we do because I think it's very appropriate for what's going on in the world now as well. Um, so Roto is an app for consumers to lease a car and without leaving their home. And that tagline hasn't changed in the last five days because people are not leaving their homes. Yeah. That has literally been our tagline since the inception of the S company. Super relevant, obviously. Very, very relevant yeah. to today. Uh, and it's what we do is very unique because n normally for a consumer to lease or buy a car, you need to shop. Mm -hmm. And the way we shop for automobiles is in stores, car dealerships. You need to go from dealer to dealer to dealer. There's a ton of interaction. You need to find what you're looking for. You need to negotiate a price, fill out credit applications. It's a long, arduous process. 
Um, so we took that transaction, which is normally complex and takes a long time, and we simplified it, put it onto a mobile application where in a few swipes you can see the car you want at an actual price that's specific to you. Mm. So like any other e-commerce transaction, I see a, a box of, of nuts on the internet or I see a, f a, a price for a flight. What I see is what I pay. So that's what we've done for car leasing. Um, and then the vehicle gets, you place the order and the vehicle gets delivered to you from the local car dealership that that's com that, that vehicle's coming from. Yeah. So it's super yeah. appropriate to what we're doing today. And uh, you know, I, I ask Americans to go onto the app and use it. Um, we all still need cars. Your local businesses still need community support. Um, and we're doing the best that we can to allow them to continue to operate, but you know, now through the internet. Uh, which is very efficient and allows them to do it in a cost-effective and efficient way. Right, like a lot of businesses, you go out to the retail. I mean, I mean Fifth Avenue. I think a lot of the it's kind of a loss leader. Where you go in, you actually look at the product, and a lot of people kind of go online and buy it. Same thing here. Even if you're looking, I mean, personal story. I told you before when we're looking at a nice minivan, Chrysler Pacifica. My wife went out with I, and we looked at different dealerships, but then we also looked online as well to try to find the best price. So this is right. super relevant, and is spo especially if you want to avoid crowds in this time, this is a great place to start your diligence and your search, right? Absolutely, but th the fundamental difference between us and some of the other online websites is number one, we're not showing you an advertised price. Mm -hmm. We're showing you a calculated lease payment, right. So, which is your transaction price. That's the payment, that's your monthly payment, that's your due at signing, and the vehicle shows up with the contract in hand and it's yours, we've got to that price by doing all the heavy lifting for you in the background, by doing the negotiating automatically through a very sophisticated algorithm, by taking all of the available rebates and, and discounts that are out there for you sure. on that specific car and automatically applying it to guarantee you effectively the best price. And then the second difference between us and everyone else that's out there is, is the ability to actually complete the transaction. When you go to other car related websites, you're eventually ending up at the dealership. Yeah. With us, you're completing the transaction on the app and we're bringing the vehicle to you. So it's really appropriate for the times that we're in right now. Yeah, delivery is a nice okay. little touch, right? Yeah, just I, a little. A nice it was a little a week ago, now it's big. Yeah, and I think the worst part about going to buy uh, lease a car it would be, you know, you, you go there, you negotiate a price, it obviously changes, they pay another extra $200 for the key fee, or oh, you need an extra set of keys, here's another $200, and then they have to go in the back right. and talk to the guy, you right. obviously already figured right. that out, and exactly. you're the only one on the internet doing that, right? Correct, for the moment we are the only company that is doing the transaction online, for now, we're focused on new car leasing. Mm. We operate in 15 markets, 15 of the biggest cities in the country at the moment. Um, and in a few weeks, we will be announcing finance as well, where you can actually complete a finance or what's known as a retail transaction. Right. Besides for lease, so we sort of cover the entire market. That's great, that's great. What, let's talk about actually building the business itself, understand how you built the business. Uh, talk, can you t give us some tips on uh, growth? You obviously started small, you got a nice office here. We're at one pen, 22nd floor, we didn't even bring that up, we got great views all around here. But how did you scale the business? Like, were there steps al along if, you know, there's, a lot of startup founders or anyone watching try to understand someone who's done it three times. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you do it, and what are some tricks? Blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, uh, literally, uh, it's a it's a it's a a commitment that you need to just submit to. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you're once you're a hundred percent committed to it, um, you just you can't give up, and you you push every single day. Uh, every single part of building a business is difficult from the inception of the idea uh, to, to, to getting it off the ground. No one person can do everything, so finding the right people to work together with you is challenging. Um, uh, raising some money to get the business off the ground and then continue to grow is challenging. Uh, getting an industry that is stayed, it's been around for so long and it's so used to doing something a certain way mm -hmm. to go along with you is challenging. But the moral of the story is, is that if you're committed to it, you're innovative, um, there, is a, there is a way to do it, and hopefully it pays off um, at the end of the day. So that's how we did this. Like, like any other entrepreneur in any other industry, 
you know, you, you work hard and hopefully, hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll reap the fruits of your labor. Right, right. How about the hiring aspect of it? I mean, it, you did mention the algorithm, right? So did you focus more so on having just a business partner who's really good at sales or a CTO who could put that algorithm in and create the app? Like, how did you I think piece this together? So in the beginning, um, I actually uh, had a co-founder, or actually two co-founders, that yeah. worked together with me, and they were focused on the tech element. I was more focused on the business development and sales side. So I would go into the car dealerships and introduce them to this idea. I mean, you know, it was, it was wild, but uh, the, you know, some car dealerships bought into it very early on. They saw what type of differentiator it was versus what was out there, and they looked at it as a complement to their business. Um, while simultaneously we were building the tech. So I was developing the business ideas mm -hmm. um, and doing sort of the boots on the ground sort of work and then melding that together with a team of, of developers that I had worked on other projects with and they were close friends as well. And we sort of put it together. It took us about nine months from the inception of the idea to get a minimal viable product sort mm -hmm. of put together. The auto industry in general is a, is a really, really difficult industry. Mm -hmm. So many moving parts. Um, a, a ton of large corporations that you need to you need to get attention from. So it was just a real you know regulation, a lot of different uh, challenges. Every single part of it was a challenge, but we just took one day at a time and sort of you know mapped it out and started to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And about nine months into the business, we had this app that was just extremely basic. Yeah. Just the ability to calculate a price, and it was like okay, so now we have something. And then we moved from there. We started to expand the team. Um, we hired some salespeople to help us expand the network. We hired some marketing people to help get some customers, um, you know, some design people and slow operations people. And slowly the team started to come together. And now it's a few years later and, you know, the business is flourishing. Right. I, I mean, you, you mentioned the ideas and, and putting them all together, right? As you create the ideas and you want to communicate that with your team, how about the efficient the, the time efficiency of sitting together, you know, in that war room with your team and figuring out, oh, we should go this way or this way is actually the smartest way, or, you know. Right. Uh, how does it, because it, it, something we always talk about kind of is the time efficiency, meeting efficiency, uh, and it kind of works into company culture too, but like how do you collaborate the S best? For starters, there are a lot of software tools and methodologies that we've adopted from uh, s most of my team coming from prior companies and prior businesses. And there's a lot of cutting edge stuff that if you adopt and you use, they help you manage process, time, um, and overall you know, workflow. So I highly recommend, without mentioning specific names, um, entrepreneurs use these things. And there's a, there's a, 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 it's dramatically different working with them, working without them. A lot of them have free trial periods or, or you know, freemium type models where you mm -hmm. can use the basic product and so on. I encourage people to use that. So we, we subscribe to that um, you know, culturally. But outside of that, it's, it's a, there's a ton of trial by error and there's a ton of brainstorming. Um, once you have a core team of people that are sort of committed to the goal and are on the same, everybody's sort of collaborating on the same path, uh, a lot of that becomes fun, yeah, and it becomes super interesting. You know, the process of bouncing ideas off each other and trying stuff out and pulling stuff that doesn't work, pushing stuff that does. Uh, you know, is our day to day really iteration in a startup, regardless of what industry you're in, is the path to success. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of that with those uh, aforementioned products, and then sort of team culture of collaboration to hopefully get to an end game. And for us, it's still really early. You know, we're still figuring stuff out. And then this tsunami comes along that throws everybody for a loop, and how do you adapt to it? Right. Can you take advantage of it, of course, in the most positive uh, way? Um, so there's, you know, it's just going with the flow as, as, as the time, you know, we roll with it as the, times, yeah. as the time goes by. Iteration is the pathway to success. I, I like believe that. so. That's a good yes. one. That's a gem right there. Uh, we talk about partnerships, right? Uh, what type of partnerships have worked for you in the past? Uh, maybe you could give a shout out to somebody, but more so why it's worked, uh, what techniques have worked throughout. So that when people are looking for other partners, CEOs or companies to partner with, uh, they can look back and think, you know, this is a good way to start the relationship. I think being hyper-focused on realistic partnerships in the early days is very important. Y obviously, you need to 
have high aspirations and, and, and lofty goals, but you need to be practical at the same time. So for us, the early partnerships were car dealers. We needed mm -hmm. a source of vehicles. Mm -hmm. You can't sell vehicles directly from a manufacturer. There is a supply chain, a franchise network that's been built out over the last 80 years or so. So we needed to tap into that. And I, and I was lucky enough to get a receptive audience with the dealers, and it started with that. And then once we moved past that, there was a myriad of other partnerships that we needed all the way up to lenders, OEMs, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so my shout out right now is to the car dealer. And I, I, I think it's extremely, again, appropriate for the time where the car dealer is essentially a local business, mm -hmm. supporting their communities and so on. And I, I, people need to know that, that they're a part of their community. They support the Little League team and, they, and, they, and, and their local politicians and so on and so forth. Uh, it's extremely important that we do whatever we can to support the local dealers. And there's 13,000 dealers that employ a million and a half people across the country just at the local level. Your local service station and the car salesman and, 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 the, dr and the drivers and, and everything that goes into that. Um, so it starts with them and then it moves up from there through the supply chain. Um, now the types of partnerships that we're looking for are what's known as affinity partners. So. Our focus has shifted a little bit from building the technology and building sort of what we call the left side of the marketplace, which is supply. Mm. Now we need consumers. Right. So we're looking for companies that have large consumer memberships or large consumer bases. For example, a AAA or a USAA, where they, you know, they may have, might have mm -hmm. anywhere from you know, 5 million or more members, where they can then go advocate for us and say, hey, this is a great way for you to get a new vehicle. It's, it's inexpensive, it's efficient, it's still supporting the local dealer. Right. So that's, uh, that's where our uh, partnerships uh, sh should now come from, um, and that's where our focus is. I like that. It, who should they reach out to hypothetically if, you know, it, again, if they're watching here and they maybe are a possible affinity partner, who on your team uh, do you think they could reach out to? And tag we have a, a VP of Business Development, Patrick McKeever. Uh, shout out to him as well. Um, you know, working working his team hard during these tough times yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, so Pat is probably the best guy. You can find him on LinkedIn um, or myself for that matter. Sure. Um, or anyone else in the Roto team will. You know, if you just you know search us on LinkedIn, you'll find anybody in the Roto team. It'll get to the right person. Yeah. Carlos Cisco has this select card. He's got a nice little group, and I think that he gives discounts to his, his members. And exactly. I think, I think he, he's been on the show, so I'll definitely connect you with him. Yeah, I think awesome. that's a good one. Uh, how about your network itself? You've built a network, I'm sure, over, over the years, CEOs, partners, or whatever it may be. What's worked for you to stay in touch with them? What's worked for you to grow that network? Um, you know, give us your thoughts on network. So for me personally, I have like real relationships or no relationship. So my network is, is just very real. Uh -huh. It's people um, uh, you know, that share the same interests. Um, where you know, peop I can help them or they can help me. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's rather smaller than your average type network, but I think it's, it's a solid uh, sort of network. And I, I guess it's, it's built over time. Mm -hmm. um, it's built through introductions. Uh, for some of us who are not that social, you know, it's, it's limited. Um, but uh, for me, it's about more meaningful relationships and relationships that um, that are um, that have value versus hey, you know, I have five thousand followers or five thousand connections, yeah, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, again, I think it's built on time and it's built on on interests. Um, LinkedIn obviously is a great platform. My other social networking is rather limited. Um, so it's primarily LinkedIn if we're talking about a digital right, platform. Right. We're here, right here, right now. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a good that's a good tip too. I mean, I like to t talk to you know when we do the uh, entre networking groups is really when you're connecting with someone on LinkedIn, whether it be you or anybody else, to not just say, hey, let's be connected. It's more so try to think about how to authentically add value to them. And even if it's not, I appreciate what you're doing and then follow up when you actually can find something to add value. So you're not spamming them or helping, you know disrupting their business when they're looking down and just saying, oh, okay, this guy's going to be my connection. No, but like maybe I can add value with, through affinity partnership or maybe I have a dealership that I can, I can connect with on Roto. Right. Uh, just two quick comments that I yeah. make on, on networking. Yeah. Um, something that I learned in my own professional career. Number one, you never know sort of what, where a relationship leads to. You never know what type of person can help you or how you can help them. And it always has to be bilateral. You know, so you, might be, you might think you need to get to 
you know, the VP of a certain group or an SVP or whatever, mm -hmm. in many cases, someone a little bit junior will go to bat for you or someone a little bit junior can help or, and vice versa. So take, take those relationships seriously regardless of the level of person that's reaching out to you and the level of person that you're reaching out to. Um, I think that's a very, very important point. Some of my most successful full interactions and most successful business um, successes have come from out of left field of someone who I never thought um, you know, could actually achieve what I needed. And the flip side to that is paying it forward. Be conscious of people that are asking for your advice or people that are asking for your introduction. Life is very, very short. Mm -hmm. Don't hold on to those things. Share them. Really, just sort of share them and help wherever you can. What is it? It's an email. It's a phone call. It's a text message. So yeah. what? And if the other person, the party that you're introducing to or wherever you're helping says no, you did your part. Yeah. That's the first thing that I would highlight. The second thing is um, we're in a really interesting time where social networking is probably changing and maybe dramatically. And I think that, um, and I'm, I'm really thinking about this. I actually started to go to sleep with a pen and paper next to me and I haven't done that in years to just write down anything that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And I literally leave it on my night table and I'll wake up and I'll scribble something down. I'll look at it in the morning. Um, I think that there's, gonna, there's a ton of opportunity now around that category of how do we start to interact. You know, in, out of 2008, an entirely new economy was born the sharing economy, the Airbnbs and the Ubers of the world. It was out of necessity to some extent and, uh, and amazing businesses and opportunities were born out of it. Now this social distance category, and I, I put it in quotations as it's still sort of, where the definition is still being figured out, um, I think is, is sort of at the birth pangs. Yeah. So who knows where that sort of evolves and how we start to interact with people going forward um, and what's born from it and so on and so forth. I just hope that it, it is good and it's positive. Yeah. And this distance is more superficial than it is anything else so that society doesn't lose its, uh, you know, its, uh, its important connections. Right. Well, I mean, that's why we like this platform, LinkedIn, for what we're doing right here. I mean, LinkedIn is right in the background. You got the Empire State Building in the background. But the idea, I mean, I think I look at it as, as a digital business card almost, and you're connecting with them. And I think hopefully as they evolve their platform, this could help out uh, connect everybody too. We, we usually take viewer questions at this time. So we've asked people to submit the questions, but we're obviously light uh, connect everybody too. We, we usually take viewer questions at this time. So we've asked, we'll answer it, uh, or Nathan will answer it, or anybody else will answer it on their team. So definitely submit your questions. This is replayed uh, in the, in reshared. So uh, even if you're not watching this live, definitely ask the questions and we'll engage t with you that way. Uh, we're talking about the question I have actually to throw in there. Y I saw that you are hiring. Uh, w what types of, uh, it, it's a fun funky time obviously right now, but what types of, how about this, what types of people are you looking for uh, to join the team? What types of characteristics do you like to hire? It's, uh, huh. that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I, I think it starts with smart, uh, and then everything else comes after that. Um, you know, commitment, ambition, um, willingness to work hard, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth, just from as far as character traits are concerned. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, we are actually hiring okay. for a variety of roles. I mentioned the business development roles, yep. development roles yep. for these affinity partnerships. We're hiring in that area. Uh, we're hiring on some new initiatives. Um, I mentioned that we're going to be launching for um, what's known as retail, um, which is, uh, uh, should be launching in the next few weeks. So we're looking for some auto experience in that area. Mm -hmm. We're always hiring for tech. Um, and then we're hiring for a used car initiative that we're sort of developing as a pilot program in the background. So um, as, as layoffs probably begin, um, and some people who hear about this possibly come from the auto industry, the auto lender industry, the auto technology or otherwise technology industries, um, hopefully we'll be able to hire in all those categories as uh, things settle down a little bit. But, but um, as a matter of, of principle right now, we're still in hiring mode. That's great. That's great. And maybe if you could shift your, you know, you were talking about if you're in the auto industry and you need to shift a little bit into the technology and auto industry, I think this is a place to start. Yeah. Uh, let's leave off with the words to live by, personal mantra, ethos. I know, you know, it's kind of corny and cheesy at times, but when, wh what do you get up and kind of gets you going? 
I, I think on most days it would probably be corny and cheesy, but today I would say, today I would say um, if I can invoke God for a second, I think that it is probably a time to uh, you know, take pause for a second and acknowledge that there's, a, uh, you know, regardless of whatever religion you, you are connected with, I think that it is a time to sort of acknowledge that there's a greater power out there. And us humans, you know, we're mere mortals. And you see how quickly, you know, life changes and there are things out there that we can't control. So I think it's really important to just sort of acknowledge that uh, every day, but specifically in the times that we're living at now. Mm -hmm. Maybe say a prayer if you're religious. Um, go to your, your, your church, go to your synagogue, you know, hand it off to your children. Um, so I think that's actually really, really important. It starts with that, and for me personally, that's something that's very important. Um, and then the second thing is, in, in these challenging times, to be kind. Right. And to recognize that some of the people around you are probably suffering or struggling, whether it's with their health during this crisis, their employment, employment, um, charity comes to the surface. As it, gets, as, as it becomes more challenging for you as an individual and harder for you, it probably means that it's having impact on the person that you're affecting. So keep that in mind. None of us know where this thing sort of ends up and how bad this crisis gets, but I'd keep those two things in mind um, as things start to, start to play themselves out. Solid. Be kind to one another. Keep your distance. Air bump. Thank yeah. you very much. There you, you go. Uh, that's it. Nadal's going to hit the music. Appreciate your time. Connect with Nathan. Connect with me. And share. Please share. Tag somebody and uh, ask some questions. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.